Hey everybody and welcome to the Listen to Keith Harkin podcast, episode number six. Today on the podcast is the one and only David Howley. David is the lead singer and guitar player for the amazing band who hailed from Galway City on the west coast of Ireland called We Banjo 3. I thoroughly enjoyed this podcast. David's an awesome player and he's got lots of insight into songwriting, life and touring and lots of other inspirational things that I'm sure you'll take from the podcast. Uh, please check out their music. Instagram handles at We Banjo 3. David Howley is his handle. Um, they're an amazing band and they tour non-stop all around the world, Canada and America predominantly. I'm sure a lot of my listeners have heard of them before. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please check out my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash listen to Keith Harkin. It's my Patreon community that keeps me going, that keeps me funded and keeps me in the running to keep making this amazing content for you guys to listen to and enjoy for free. I love you all. Please click the subscribe button at the end. Enjoy the podcast. Here we go. David Howley from We Banjo 3. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Oh, you know, I'm just here in my leopard print shirt, uh, wearing the same PJ bottoms for the last three days. Yeah. <laughs> Living the dream. <laughs> Loving the dream, David. Uh, you are in Nashville right now? Yeah, yeah. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. It's sunny outside. It was raining yesterday. It's exciting times, you know. It's uh, it actually the sun actually has been shining here for the past three or four days in Ireland. Of course, really? yeah, of course that's that's you know in Ireland the only time the sun shines is when the kids go back to school and when you have to quarantine. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quarantine is great. Is the, the 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 whole the whole country is like ah we put on a bit of sunshine now. There's quarantine there. Yeah, the sun it actually. Could be worse. It's, it could be way worse, man. I'm not. I'm really not complaining about it. It is what it is. I just keep saying that. Everybody, all the people listening to these podcasts, the first of all my podcasts, everybody, we all speak about coronavirus. It's really weird, but mm -hmm. it's just kind of inevitable. How everybody, it's kind of just on their minds. Um, how are you coping with the the apocalypse now? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually coping really well. Yeah, I'm kind of converted my life into, I suppose, being home or um. I'm normally on the road with the lads quite a good bit. So, and I moved from London about probably three and a half, maybe four years ago, um, and lived a fairly fast paced life there as well. So, this is probably for me the first time that I've actually slowed down enough to, I don't know, feel, you know, you know what I mean? It's like the feeling yeah. of home. I know it's a, what a crazy time to be experiencing this, this the, the feeling of being home, but. Uh, yeah, it's kind of it's a weird one. I it's it there's I'm sure for yourself as well. There it's like it's as musicians we're not used to being in one place for that very long. So when it not happens, used to being in in, the, in one place for so long, and also not used to like not having things on the books, like in every other month. No, like you might be you might be like sweet. I've got like four or five weeks off now at home, which would be a long stretch. For yeah. people who tour like as much as yourself and myself, but right now, like I haven't got a show until October, and I'm just like, this is insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. We were, we were, yeah. But then here's the other side of it: is that th this is a a breather for musicians to. I think, I think that music, uh, it's so important in music, and particularly with the way we live our lives, we don't get this opportunity to actually stop, take a perspective check, and go. Is what I'm doing honest? Is what I'm doing authentic? Is it worthwhile? Is what I'm doing like when you know when you were 17 and you were, you know, you were still in school and music was your little escape from, you know, doing your maths homework, and you you but you had this end, abundance of time to pour into it. You sat and you learned a Tom Rillo solo on the guitar, or you went and you decided that you wanted to learn exactly how Doc Watson sang that thing. And you, you had the time, or, you know, you listened to a Paul Brady sing, and you were like, what tuning is he using? You had the time yeah. to do that uh, when you were It's 17. funny you say that. I actually said that to Kelsey two days ago. I was like, I can't remember the last time where I actually sat down and learned stuff. Like, actually decided to get better at a certain thing on the guitar or do like learn a song like I would I, you know like you and me growing up in Ireland in the style of playing that we do you can play yeah. anything it's just how it is and it's not like a boastful thing if you name any song I'll probably play it right through with the first time round I might get a chord wrong but the second time round round that's it 
And, you know, I just can't always busk my way through songs yeah. and life. But in the last week, I've learned like a bunch of music, like properly sat down, learned the words, yeah. learned the chords, arranged it, and it's been amazing. They have that. Yeah. I haven't got to do that in a long time. And that's that pause. That's that momentary... Uh, that's that momentary pause that I don't think a lot of us have ever had. And, and, it, and it comes from... It's partially self-inflicted, obviously, because it's... I mean, we're choosing to be on the road that long, that for that much. Um, but it's also kind of industry standard in some ways. I mean, touring seven, six or seven months of the year is probably a lighter schedule than uh, than most people. But it's still like that's still a lot, of, lot of the year to be gone and it'll be on the road. Um, and you're kind of in survival mode then by midway through the tour, and you're maybe not picking up your instrument as much. Um, and I think that that's a positive thing in some ways that like in, in tour mode, you you really hone the stuff you're playing on stage every night. You get really, really good at playing 20, 30 songs. But on non-tour mode, being able to take a step back and look at your writing, look at the, the music that you've been producing, the way you've been producing it, and being able to go and reflect on it and say, is this authentic? Is this who I am? Is this, is my message still the same? Like, like some of the songs that we play in We Banjo 3 were songs Trying to Love is a song that we uh, that was on our uh, string theory record. I wrote Trying to Love when I was 17, mm. <laughs> which is yeah. uh, 11 years ago. And This Is Home I wrote when I was 21. And so those were songs that took 10 years to actually, like they took eight or nine years to come on an album. And now it's like I'm writing a song and, you know, me and, me and the lads will have co-writes together and we write a song and then, we're expecting to put that on an album within the next year. Yeah. And there's, a, there's a massive amount of reflection that has to happen within your music. If that's like, they it just, it's changed. The game's changed so much as you progress through music. I think at times it's, it's funny. It's funny that you say that. I actually, I decided that I was going to stop this year. Um, last year I had made up my mind that I was going to stop touring after June um, for mm. at least, at least six to eight months. Um, I know I, mm. I remember I called you earlier in the year and we yeah. were talking about going to do a few shows. At the most for the rest of the year, that's all I was like really thinking and doing. If a buddy or a band that I knew or liked asked me to come out on the road for like a half a dozen shows or a dozen shows and I would do it for the fun of it, you know, just to get to yeah. play and tour with your friends. But I made a conscious decision last year. I was like, that's it. I mean, I've been touring nonstop now since I was basically 20 and I'm 34 um, in June. You know, it's, it's, a, it's mm. a lot of miles. It's a lot of tours. Um, and the way I tour too, I don't take any days off at all. I just don't like days off. I just, I don't like them. It sounds stupid. <laughs> I, love get, I love getting on stage and literally not even having to look at each other. And not, not in a bad way, but like not even having to look at each other and you're all like a moving, you're like one living organism on the stage when you're playing together. Even if it's just a two-piece, Peter and I had done a two-piece on the last tour that I had done um, before Christmas. And we'd done like, I don't know, it was something stupid, like 32 shows in 36 days or something like that. And halfway through the tour, me and Peter, it was so awesome to be, it was, he was like my right hand and I was like his left hand on the piano. We were just like, the one instrument playing together and it's really cool to do that but mm. i decided to take time out and it's kind of funny how this all i actually wanted to start a podcast in june i wanted to start a patreon i actually signed up to start a patreon page in october last year and didn't have the time to finish it didn't have the time to create content yeah. for fans so yeah. there's a silver lining in the all these clouds there is yeah and it's i guess it's the and i mean for people who are music lovers and people who are fans of us and, and our music and li like what we do, they're the lifeblood of what of of what our career is. I mean, uh, and to be able to offer, I think it's a it's a special opportunity for us as musicians to be go to dig deep and go, okay, I can't do what I normally do. I can't go out and play shows. That's what we're that's what we're bred to do. Like you know, like yeah. how many bar how many bar shows have you done in your life? Like how many Too many. how many times have you walked into a room full of people who do not care who you are and don't want to listen to you, and that you've you're too, way you're, too many way too know, many <laughs> and and you cut your teeth on those gigs and then now you're playing playing shows where people are buying tickets. It's amazing. 
but it's people also actually very... people actually like you and actually go to the bar to see you as opposed to go to the bar drink and look over dude i used to do this i used to do this um residency gig in Derry city right in a bar called mason's billy campbell used to give me a gig billy thank you for the gig i'm very grateful and one night I went down to the bar. It was a, and it was like I was like seventeen or eighteen. So at that time you were partying a lot. You were going out all the yeah, time. The weekend you didn't sleep. So come Sunday at six o'clock, the last thing on the planet you wanted to do was go get a PA system, load it into a taxi because I didn't have a car, and set it up in a shithole bar, where you knew that nobody cared what you played at all. Nobody yeah. cared about you. Nobody gave a shit if you learned that Paul Brady song back to front the day before. And I remember one night going in there to play, and the barman, do you know in Ireland, the way they've got the football on, they've got the big screens, yeah. you know, and yeah. the screen was on the stage, and I was setting up, and there was like half a dozen dudes watching TV on the screen, and I was getting set up, and I got a beer or whatever, and uh, the barman had the top 100 YouTube funniest videos on, on the screen, and uh, he was a new barman, and I'm sitting there, the screen like is playing through me on the stage, and I went up to start, and I was like, "Bro, can you can you turn that off?" And the barman wouldn't turn it off. <laughs> so I'm standing playing this fucking show that I didn't want to be doing in the first place. And this guy's watching the top funniest 100 videos, and I could see half the bar laughing at the videos that it's playing all around me that I can't see. And I was like, "I'm going to murder this barman. I don't know who he is. He doesn't know who I am." So I remember phoning up. I stopped for like me way earlier than I should have for my halftime break and I phoned up the yeah. owner and I was like, bro, this asshole won't turn off the TV and I'm trying to play, I'm trying to play a show. You're paying me to play a show. And uh, I don't think the guy was, in fairness, I think they, I think they kicked him out. I can't remember, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, what you're saying is all those shitty shows that we've all done a million times more than we ever should have, mm. you know, and to be going out and actually achieving what you've always wanted to do is for the people that like dream. your music, dig your music, and yeah. then that all getting stopped, it's like taking drugs away from a drug addict. You know, that's our yeah. thing. And that's that's the opportunity. Because in the same sense, and, I, and I, I don't know, there's a part of me that goes, they were shitty shows, absolutely. But they <laughs> were still shows. And like, of course. They were, and and we, we, at the time, probably appreciated them so much. What I give to go out into, uh, I'd stand on the corner of the street. I have done it. I've gone out on the corner of the street. I've sat on my porch and played with the hope that someone in the vicinity might hear me because that's that's what you're like that's what we were born to do in some ways we we're bred to do it and so now our challenge is okay how do we how do we take what we do as musicians how do we distill that down and get down to what the core of it is and do it in a different way and like i've watched some of your live streams i've known for you for years and you've always been you're one of the, the geniuses out there, I think, in our industry of like <laughs> Keith Harkins. All you always have a, a way around and a plan, um, and I think that it's an interesting time because it, it it's just it's a collective thing. It's solidarity as well. Your shows are cancelled. My shows are cancelled. My 100%. house, my housemates' shows are cancelled. We're all cancelled out. So it's like, how can we help each other? How can we? And it's to provide what's needed at the moment is music, man. Music is an antidote for some of this shit that we're dealing with. Like, it doesn't matter what you're going through. I, like, music, music's kept many a people alive. Music's kept me alive in my life. Like, I, like we, this is, it's like a the symbiosis of, we need the crowds. The crowds, they, they want our music and they'll come to our shows. They'll buy our tickets. But we need them. Like, we need them probably more 100%. than they need us. 100%. Because the performance, the getting up on stage, that's the drug, as you said. Yeah, and I think too, I, I hope, you know, there's always that fear that after all this blows over, hopefully sooner than later, that people just go back to their old ways. You know, and I please, I hope if anybody's listening, please just realize what's happened over the last few months and don't go back yeah. to your old ways of just doing stupid shit. Just think about things a bit deeper than what, you know, because I'm sure you've all had a lot of time at home to think yeah. about what's actually happening in your life right now and don't go back. They are foolish ways of Black Friday buying and eating crappy foods and, you know, mm -hmm. just look after yourselves after this. But I do think that I hope that music after this and artists after this and, you know, actors after this, poets, playwrights, producers, engineers get held at a higher esteem 
than what they have done in the past 10, 15 years in the industry. Yeah. You know, I feel like musicians in the last 10, 15 years have been cheapened dramatically because of this culture of free, you know, Netflix, everybody pays, what, $6 a month or whatever, but music's free, movies are free, everybody got their hack websites that they watch movies on, and, you know, yeah. all these people work their entire lives to get to that point and create uh, this amazing content and music for people they listen yeah. to, and the thing is, right now, this is all the people have to take their mind off things, is this content, is these poems, is this art, is these movies, is the yeah. music that we're all trying to make. So I just hope that people after this, you know, hold it a wee bit at a, at a bit of higher steam than, than what it has been in the past. Not that it's, you know, obviously not our fans. Everybody's got their diehard fans. But, you know, I mean the general sort of people, yeah. you know, most people wouldn't think twice of just, you know, like sometimes people come up to me during my tour, and I don't know if this happened to you, but they hand me like copied CDs and fake merchandise and ask you to sign it. And you're just like, God damn it. <laughs> you just sign it anyway. And your mind, you, and, you know, yeah. it's not out of badness. It's not, they're, they're not no. doing it to be nasty. They're not doing it. It's because they just don't read. They just don't know. That's how they were brought up. You know, yeah. younger kids don't see it that way at all. Yeah. And I think that there's an interesting point in there of like holding music in a much higher theme. And you know what? I'll throw myself in there too. You know something I've actually changed in the last couple of weeks, and I didn't realize I changed it until, after, like, until a couple of days ago. I've stopped listening to music mindlessly. So, like, I'd normally have music on all the time. I'd have podcasts running or whatever, you know, like my like my son off in the kitchen, be playing music all day. I've stopped doing that, and I've started the other night myself and. Uh, another songwriter that I live with, uh, Scott Mulvihill, sat down on the couch and I said, here, did you ever hear of John Martin? And he went, no, I never heard of John Martin. And Dude. We, what, a, what a guy. John Martin's one of my favorite. I supported John Martin when I was 17. Way, did you? Way. And I called him an asshole on stage. <laughs> and was he? Dude, I am the biggest <laughs> John Martin fan. Not the, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Oh, Whatever. I'm the biggest John Martin fan. I've always loved John Martin. When I lived in London when I was 18, I fell on the solid air. Someone told me to listen to it. And I fell in love with that guy's voice and playing. And and uh, I got the gig for supporting him in Derry in my hometown. Uh, my mate Baz. Baz, if you're listening, what's happening? Uh, Baz was managing the bar, Sandino's in Derry, and they, he was playing. It was a big deal. You know, John Martin's a big artist. And uh, it was a huge deal for me to support him. And I spent weeks getting ready for this gig. I was learning all these songs, writing, like really busting my ass to get this 20-minute segment together. And uh, John Martin, for those of you who don't know him, he was, a, he was a an amazing musician, but he was a roaring alcoholic. And yeah. all oh, that man. day, he was at the City Hotel drinking. He was drinking double Bacardi's, and his mixer was cider. And they had a, he was in the wheelchair at the time because he'd only had one leg because he lost his leg partying. Um, do you know that? That's how he lost his leg. I didn't know. No, I, I, I didn't. Like I knew he was a roared and alcoholic and had massive problems with drugs and alcohol, but I didn't know how he, how he lost his leg. He lost his leg. He was in a car accident, and at the time he was living with Phil Collins. Him and Phil Collins were great buddies. Wow. Uh, Solid Air is actually written about um Nick Drake. Him and Nick Drake were great friends too. Mm. May you never let your head down. Um. But yeah. he, he was in a car accident and he got his leg was in plaster up as far as his, his hip. And the doctors told him he couldn't leave the house. And at that time, he was in his height of partying. And he was like, screw this. And tore all the plaster off his leg and went out partying for three days. And got gangrene and they had to cut his leg off. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's pretty hardcore. But I was playing the show, man. They were like, Keith, you need to get on stage. John's pretty smash. You need to get on there. I was like, all right, cool. And, uh... I went up and I got into my second song and halfway through the second song, they were like, through the PA speaker, my monitors on stage, they were like, Keith, you need to, you need to get off stage. Uh, they're having a bit of a deal with, with John backstage. They have to get him on straight away. And I was like, what? I was like, this was at a John Martin concert. And I was like, well, ladies and gentlemen, this is my last song because John Martin's drunk as fuck backstage. <laughs> and the whole room was like, no way. But I was so pissed. I was like, I love John Martin. You love John Martin. That's why you're here. But just so you know, this gig means more to me than it means more to John Martin because he's drunk back there, okay? And I, like, done my gig, and I think I, like, kicks on and walked off, done my song, kicks on and walked off stage. 
And then I watched John Martin and he was amazing. And I went into the green room afterwards and uh, he was sitting there and he just looks at me and I started laughing and he started laughing. <laughs> and I was like, what would you have done? I was so cheeky when I think back. I was so young and stupid. Yeah. And he just started laughing and he was like, I would have done exactly this. He says, I'd have done worse than you. I had a, I had a wreck the stage. And I was like, well, great. He was like, do you want a drink? And I was like, aye. And we sat and had a drink and he was smoking these huge big grass joints in the green room. <laughs> And they were just letting them do it. But uh, sorry to interrupt me. I'm a massive John oh. Martin fan. Yeah, John so, Martin. So you were listening. You and you and uh, Scott were listening to. Yeah, we were, well, we sat down and we probably listened to five or six songs, and you know, I mean, really listened. I mean, uh, like every lyric, every like I and actually, that's what I was doing before I was chatting to you. Was that? Amazing. And like going, watch it. Like I trying to Google it, couldn't find it. Like then eventually found that like, oh, this is the tuning he might be using. It's like tuning my guitar down to it. It's like that. I haven't done that in yeah. years. Yeah, me neither. After we man. sat down and we listened to music. That was our activity. That was what we were doing. Listening to music was the activity. It wasn't. We weren't doing an activity and listening to music passively in the background. And I think that that is, the, that is the slight change, I would say, Keith, that I think that's the thing that you were talking about, the cheapening of music. It comes from music being free, but it also comes from our culture around music. Is it? For sure. I mean, man, how I've been writing, been working on a couple of songs for, we're thinking of doing a new banjo record the, towards the end of the year. So I've been really digging into these songs and trying to edit them and trying to get them to the best song they can be. I spent five hours yesterday on a song like and i mean i made three edits maybe in five hours i almost fucking cried last night going to bed i was so my head was busted and it's like and i think that in my heart i know that there are people who are going there's a pessimistic side of me that says those changes don't matter because nobody's even, nobody's going to listen to the song that carefully but someone might someone and someone might, might that's right and in, and in in 10 years time, in 50 years time, maybe nobody will remember who we were. Maybe nobody ah, will Ah, they'll remember care. who you are, David. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, that lad was talking shite on Keith Harkin's podcast one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they won't, yeah, but too. maybe someone would pull up our one of our songs and sit on a couch and drink whiskey and talk about the phrasing and the word choice and, and the words used. Like... And I, I'm going to hit all the commonalities, I'm sure, that you talked on on these podcasts. But, like, with the passing of John Prine, it kind of woke something again in me of going, you know, here is, like, there's, there's, it's being careful. It's being very intentional about, like, how you say things, because that's what we do. And I think that on the listener side, I hope that after this, people are, that are more intentional about the music. And there's, man, there's people out there. And I'm sure that there, we probably have some common common fans and they're amazing they come to all the shows they know every lyric they have all the merch but more than that they care about the words they care about the content they care 100%. about every single word that you've written down and that that man that fills your heart with such joy but as us also songwriters as well this is me if this didn't happen maybe i wouldn't have edited maybe i wouldn't have spent this time editing these songs Maybe, like, I go back to the song on our last record, Haven, called Don't Let Me Down. That, again, I wrote a couple of years ago. And I love the song. And it means a lot to people. And, you know, it's it was kind of the first time I ever spoke about my own personal mental health publicly. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I had the time back, maybe I would change some things. Maybe I would edit some things. Maybe I'd add a little but bit I think, more I think, David, too, I think that comes from the more and more you do it, you know, the better you get at it. It's like anything. It's like practice. I do the same thing. I look back these songs now that I wrote for what, over whatever amount of years ago, 15 years ago. And I'm like, why did I say that? Or why did I phrase that like that when there's such a simple, easy fix or a way around it? Yeah. And it's just experience. You know, it is just yeah. experience. I, I actually have on the podcast this Wednesday night, Jack Tempshin, the Eagle songwriter. Yeah, and it's exactly. amazing. Like writing with Jack is like, honestly, man, it's fascinating. Like, by the time, by the time I can even get my tongue around the words that he's written in a verse, you know, and phrase it, 
he'll have written another four options for that one verse and maybe a middle eight before I can even get my tongue around the, the 12 or 16 or 18 words that he's created in one verse. And it's just, obviously, it's raw talent, but there's also, you know, it's practice as well. And the more yeah. you do anything, your ear gets better and hears certain things and hears naiveties and things that, you mm-hmm. know, you wouldn't have heard when you first started writing, probably. Yeah. Where do you start? What, what what usually comes first to you? Is it, a, is it a melody that catches your attention or is it a, a lyric or a phrase? Is it, is it an emotion? What starts with you? Um, if I don't get that spark straight away, I don't do it. If when I'm on my own and I'm writing, if I lift the guitar and I don't think that there's something there, I know a lot of people's like, I finish the song no matter what. I, I don't, you know, mm. unless it's, unless... I like to think that my taste in music is pretty good. I, lo- I love listening to all music, you know, and I've got to I listen to everything. You know, I used to play yeah. in a live dance band. I, I love rave music. I love techno. I love drum and bass. I love every kind of music. So mm. if I haven't got that spark straight off the bat, I'm just like, well, what's the point? You know, yeah. because you know yourself when you're listening to a song, if it's a good song, you get that spark within the first four bars of the song, totally. you know. Totally. And if you're not hearing that when you're writing it, you might hammer it out for five minutes and you're just like, nah, it's not happening. And and then, Cause it just, it makes it painful and unenjoyable. And I'm not writing music because I'm, I have to, I'm doing it because I like it. And if I'm not enjoying writing a song, I don't want to finish it. Simple as that. Yeah. And that's, that's a good way to put it as well. If I'm not enjoying the song, I'm not going to finish it because if you pause on it, maybe, maybe if you pause on it, there's somewhere deeper down, farther down the line where you come around to it where you kind of look at the song through a different perspective and go, oh, like, uh, there's a song on Haven called Light in the Sky, which is a big, fast, up-tempo song. And I'll tell you, when that song was written first, it was the most moany, self-indulgent <laughs> dribble that you've ever heard. It was poor me. I wrote it when I moved to London, and I felt like when I moved there, I kind of moved there with the kind of thing that, and I'm sure you understand this feeling as well, of like, I moved there and then I felt like every time one of my family members would call me or my friends would call me, my response was, it's great. Oh, I'm having a great time out here. Oh, I'm not killing it. It's great. Because I couldn't show the weakness that maybe I had made a mistake. Maybe well, that's, this wasn't Jackson great. Brown wrote a song about that called The Road. Have you ever heard that song? No. Highways and dance halls, a good, a good song takes the fall. And he talks about ringing home and you exaggerate the good ones and you forget about the falls. Like you just don't even mention the shitty gigs, you know, and you exaggerate yeah. the good ones. And But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. And, and, that's, and that's, where, that's where Light in the Sky came from. And it was, uh, you know, um, it, it took a year. Uh, it took some growth. It took some pain. It took a few bandmates asking some questions. And it was actually up until the day we were in the studio recording it, it was still kind of, the lyrics had changed and it was more hopeful. It was more of a, what it is now, which is kind of like a story of like, you know, you left your home and everything you knew, everything that was felt comfortable and you felt like you needed to go out and make it in the world and you failed and that's okay. But just keep looking towards the sky, keep trying to push forward and, and finding some glimmer of hope and possibility and just keep going, don't stop. And that was that's the message of the song. Even up until the day we recorded it, the song was down tempo. It was kind of a little bit melancholic. Um, and this is you're talking about uh, songwriters and perspective and and collaboration. We were sitting in studio in uh, Frank Marchand's studio in Annapolis, and Enda turned to me and he goes, "Oh, the song sound like fast." And my immediate reaction was, "Fuck you! I wrote this song. Who are you to tell me?" <laughs> <laughs> who are you to tell me what to do with it and then you, and then you threw your bowl of brown m&ms at him I, i'm telling you it's so funny like <laughs> but you know something tweaked and we were in a good spot like us we were a great like we we have a good collaboration process in the band we're like our brothers as well it's kind of easy to you know we can yeah. fuck each other out of it and then 10 minutes later it's like all right i'm sorry i reacted like that uh what what was that you said so anyway yeah we we I went all right let's try it and we were, and it's like there was the song 
there was the song all the time was just under this thin veneer that I couldn't see, but somebody else could. Um, and that's that. And that and what you're saying there of like, I probably would never have seen that because it was hard for me to get back into the spot of where I was when I wrote, started writing the song. It was hard for me to get back into that space, that headspace to be able to finish it. But somebody else could at that point. I mean, that's what songwriters like that, Jack Tempson and people like that, that's their that's that again that that thing you talked about that that skill and that the, the learned experience and, and being an experienced songwriter is being able to put yourself back in that spot so you can the thing is too though you know you have to do what's best for the song you know mm. you can be that guy you can you can be like well this is my song and this is how i like it so tough you know but at yeah. the end of the day if you're a chef and you know you like eating the weirdest food but you know the food that everybody's going to buy is your weird food with an extra few ingredients thrown in. You're not going to serve them the weird food that they're not going to buy. You're going to serve them the food that everybody wants to buy. And mm-hmm. you're better off doing that for the song. You know, it's it's what's best yeah. for the song and what's best for the listener yeah. within reason. You know, And then yeah. it's up to you as the performer to take from that what you want, to make it what you want when you're mm-hmm. on stage. You know, there's many a song I sing to that... They probably don't sound that sad, but for me, there's times the tears be coming down, literally coming down my face sometimes on stage, mm-hmm. thinking about a certain point in a song or of a person that I wrote it about. And it might sound like the happiest fucking thing you've ever heard in your life, but it really ain't. But, yeah. you know, when you see the smiles of people listening to it, that is what it's all about. You know, you're there to entertain people too. Yeah, and, and you're right. It is a balance and it's creating... I suppose it's great in there. That's that's the kind of job of a musician. You're kind of an alchemist. You're trying to balance out some real stuff, some emotions. There's people there that are coming that have had hard weeks or hard days or hard months, and they're looking for some respite. And then there's people who've had a great day and they, they want to just party and sing and dance. And so there's kind of a bit of everything, isn't it? It's just kind of like creating what's authentic for you. It has to be authentic. It has to be real. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'm I mean, miserable, and I go out on stage, and then I realize that I'm actually not miserable. I'm just kind of choosing to be miserable that day, <laughs> and let it, I let it go, and I have a great night. You know, I, it's like I forgot my woes. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love actually being pissed about. No, I don't love this, but I love the feeling I get from if something has annoyed me before I go on stage, or like yeah. if I'm pissed about something or something else, and you just have to go fuck it. Let's go out here now and show these people a proper show. Yeah. And you let loose, and you just get all that anger and sadness out on the stage. You put it out there and take it out on everybody in the room. <laughs> yeah. And it's probably going to be one of your better shows. For me, in a way, I know it would be one of my better shows. Yeah. But it's you've, you've skin in the game. Skin in the game is always the best way to do it. If you're, and I, I, that's going to be a really interesting thing for all of us as performers to go back. Like, what's your first gig going to be like? You know? Oh, I'm going to be like, I'm going to work out hooded. I don't know. I'm going to do some crazy shit. Like, I don't know. I can't even say it. I'm not excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know, I, man. Like, I what's it going to be like to go out on stage again and, and be like, you know, I watched a video the other day of us on stage. I was, I've been kind of creating some, you know, stuff for, for the social, just putting out social media, like gigs and stuff like that, just to, videos and stuff that we had in the vault and I was looking through them it's like it's it looks weird it looks weird that many people in the same place like it's just how quickly you ad- adapt to a new norm yeah. yeah now is the time to for now is the time for learning it's craft it's it's learning it's a time to be uncomfortable as well I mean like there's something I really enjoy is you know Scott's a great songwriter and, and you're a great songwriter too and uh, having a community of people around you, I got friends there that I've sent songs to and been like, "Here, just give me, give me your honest feedback on this," and they've cut me in half, like to the point where I was You're like, "Jeez, like, <laughs> I asked for your feedback, but like, I can go easy, like." <laughs> so like kicking a man when he's down. Yeah, yeah, and then they'll send up a follow-up text because they forgot some stuff. It's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was only for the first verse. But that's good. I mean, that's how you get better. Like, yeah, it's so funny. So I don't know that guy Scott was your roommate. I, I do. Have you ever done Paste magazine? I've never done it. I know, I know Paste. Yeah. 
these guys would be awesome on that. I'm sure they would love the Javi. You should make that happen next time you're in New York. Um, you should yeah. definitely do paste. We've done. Um, um, but I. We have done paste. We. Because uh, paste is, is the same thing that does. Oh, they make the really cool album covers. I'm, my brain is. Day Trotter. Is Day Trotter by Paste? Day Trotter. Yeah, Daily Daily Day, Daily Globe Trotter or something like that. Or. Yeah, Day Trotter. Yeah, we've done Day Trotter. Um, it is great. Yeah, Paste is great. Yeah, I do know Paste. Yeah. So okay, I've I follow Paste on on Facebook. I love it. Like they, it's just like an awesome. They've been doing like basically what everybody's trying to create now at the minute online. But they've been doing these online every day, three times a day shows free on Facebook. And I actually came across your room. I didn't realize that guy was your roommate, Scott. Yeah. And I was like, this yeah. guy's fucking great. Where did where did he come from? <laughs> yeah, he's and Scott actually played the bass on Haven, and that's how we became friends. Is ah I, right because my for your musician uh, listeners. So this is my guitar and I have a another pickup. Uh, so I have an under saddle that picks up my normal guitar sound and then I have a, another pickup up the top here that just picks up my bass string. So I pay, I play the bass and the guitar in, in our band on stage at the same time. But recorded, it doesn't have the same oomph as a upright or electric bass. So when we recorded Haven, I wanted to have a real bass player and I knew Scott, kind of knew him, not terribly well, but I knew knew we mutual friends, and I called up Scott. So he played bass on our uh, last studio record, uh, Haven. And that's how we became friends. And it's been great. Like, we've been, we've written, oh, probably at least 10 songs at this point over the last Amazing. month. But again, it's that thing of being able to be in a room with somebody who's like, who's hungry, who is willing to be honest with you, Um and is it just a, a different perspective? I mean, me and you have a similar perspective because we grew up in Ireland. Uh, we grew up in different parts of Ireland, but we grew up within a kind of a similar same scene. culture. Yeah, same scene, same influences, same stuff that we were probably exposed to. Um, Do you miss Galway? A lot, especially right now. Um, there's a... There's a soul about Galway that is. Galway's a fantastic, my, well, pro, maybe my favorite city in all of Ireland. I love Galway. That's amazing. I And I'm very proud to be from there. Like, there's so many great musicians. But even more than that, Galway is like, it's about the people. And it's it's kind of a big town in a lot of respects. You know, it's not, it's not the massive city that Dublin is and. And Dublin's great too, but Galway has a quaintness, a kind of a locality about it. Like you walk down Shop Street in Galway, you'll meet like 50 people you know. But that's 50 out of like probably a thousand people that you'll see in the whole street. Like it's not a huge town. It's it's pretty, you know, and, and great music scene, great food scene. It's a kind of the bohemian getaway, I suppose, in Ireland. Yeah, but I, 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 I ab- absolutely love Galway. Yeah. And I love the most about Galway, I suppose, is like, you go there and there's people, you meet people from other countries and you're like, how long have you been in Galway? And they're like, I came here for a holiday like 12 years ago. Like, <laughs> the amount of people who have ended up in Galway because they came on holidays and then just stayed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, even like the Galway, I'm sure you've been to the Galway races. Yeah. 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 I don't that one year by complete chance. I was in Celtic Thunder and about... Um, about two days before the Galway races, I was brought mm. to Louis Copeland's. We used to go to Louis Copeland's in Dublin, which is like a famous esque uh, suit shop in Dublin City. And uh, I was brought in there, and we could just basically lift whatever we wanted. Basically, there was a tab and whatever you wanted Armani, Gucci, whatever stupid like suit, like a blazer, would cost like two, three thousand euros. Um, <laughs> And at the time, I used to think, I'm not paying for this. And then I realized that, that we paid for it all. But that's another story altogether. But uh, I remember then, the Galway Races was on like two days later. And uh, mm. Gary Monroe and all those boys, Monroe's yeah. and Galway. Monroe's, yeah. what's happening with all you beautiful big men. Love all those yeah. people. Um, They're amazing. I was like, let's go to the races. And I remember calling one of my buddies and I was like, yo, we're going to the races. And I knew he just came in the money about two weeks beforehand. I was like, go and take a thousand euro out of the bank right now. He's like, oh, I haven't even got a suit. I was like, I've got suits. Don't worry. <laughs> I remember giving him and two of my other friends, like these brand new suits that were worth more than their cars. I was like, oh, you wear this. You wear that. 
And my dad, God love me dad, my dad was still working shift work in a in a, a dump called Orange Belt and Company making fan belts. And there was these two uh, girls I seen on Dublin, friends of mine, Helen Moran, uh, in Galway, Helen and Moranya. And uh, we all went to the, the Galway races together. And my dad came home from work, from shift work, and turned on RT News. And he says there was me and my two buddies, and I had two girls under each arm walking into the Galway races with a suit on and a trilby hat and sunglasses. And my dad was like, I absolutely hate my son right now. <laughs> But the Galway races, man, is an awesome time. Like, we had such a freaking blast. If anybody hasn't been down to the races, yeah. I've only got to do it once, and I keep meaning to go back and do it yeah. again. But, and, and in but that even not, not just when the races is on, Galway's always always a good time. It's a weird, it's a weird, like, you talked, you brought up Gary Monroe. Like, Gary has supported us as a band for years, as well as, you know, Googie and the Roisin Dove. I don't know anybody in the Roisin Dove. I only know Gary through a weird coincidence, but he's about he's about it but like gary has monroe's live great music venue this across the street is is uh the roshin dove another roshin amazing dove. music venue and you have these music venues that are they don't just like book bands they build bands which is something that's kind of you know they'll take you when you're nobody and they'll go right we'll put you in the front bar and then hopefully next year we'll bring you back and we'll put you in the main room for you know 100 tickets, yeah. and then we'll try and push yeah. you again and they eventually will bring you back for two nights sold out because yeah. that's, and I think that that, that's the energy I think that keeps Galway going is that there's a kind of a locality, kind of a, uh, a building kind of idea. Like how do you build people up? It's great. I miss it a lot, but then it's, I suppose it's like the trade off is I, I, I do love living in Nashville. I love the community that I've built out here and the friends and no more than yourself. I know that, you know, you spend a long, long time in LA, um, and you have that community of people who are, they're like-minded, but they're different. They grew up different. They have different stories yeah. and they're different, you know. And it's kind of cool way to grow as well as, you know, to be surrounded by people who, who aren't like you in some ways, you know. Yeah, I think that's what drives you. Like, L.A. is a funny one. You know, L.A. is not just, I think L.A. is an amazing place for music, but L.A. is uh I think if you have any sort of drive in you, L.A. is the place to be because, you know, everybody is trying their best in L.A. Mm-hmm. And it's not like a show offy thing. Everybody goes there to succeed. They don't go there to just, like, hang out. The majority of people go there to be the best at what they're doing. And if you have any sort of um, any sort of thing in you that's growing and needs to get out, you're going to try and beat everybody else around you too. It's not, but it doesn't feel competitive. You know, it just feels when you see other people doing things, you're like, shit, I have to do better than that. If that's how mm-hmm. it took them to get there, you know, I have to do better than that. But LA, LA, is a, LA is a beautiful and a very weird town. You know, I never done the whole schmoozing thing in LA. A lot of my friends did do the schmoozing thing in LA. That's why I moved there. The record company is like, you should move here. We'll invite you to this. We'll take you to that. But I just hated the whole fakeness of it. I, I, that's the one thing in LA I couldn't really get my head around. Clingers and climbers. I've got a lyric in a song called Clingers and Climbers. And I sort of, and this isn't me shitting on LA. I love LA too. But I feel like a lot of people there, the first thing they ask in LA is like, well, what do you do? They're nearly like only speaking to you if you can help them out. I found in a way, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I found if they, if they could, uh, if you can help them out, they cling on to you. And they'll, they'll sort of leech off you. And if, they, if you can't help them out, they just climb over you and go to the next mm. one, the Clingers and the Climbers Club. Um, but yeah, LA gave me everything. You know, it gave me a lot of opportunities. I've made a lot of amazing friends there. I've made a lot of amazing mm. memories there. And it's always going to be there. You know, it's not going anywhere. We're, we're just kind of gone from there for a minute. And to be honest with you, I'm kind of glad I am where I am right now in Ireland. Um, I yeah. would hate to be in our apartment, our tiny studio yeah. apartment in Venice Beach climbing the walls killing each other <laughs> yeah well it's it's the uh, outside is I, mean, I went for a walk yesterday it was raining but I still went out and I realized that like, those are the things that are important in life like how many great songs were thought of how many great musical ideas were thought of when people were bored outside walking in the green Walking in the woods, go walk in your front garden, whatever it is. Very hard to do that in an apartment. I used to live in an apartment here in town. Um, and I lived downtown in Asheville for a while. It was lovely. Like, it was nice. Um, but like that, it was kind of... 
I don't think we're meant to be that way as humans. I think we're meant no, to be... I mean, a lot of people, I think a lot of people choose to be that way, but in general, I mean, I have to be outside. I'm outside all year. In Ireland, I, Irish people hibernate. I feel like people here do not do anything in the winter time. Yeah. They just, they don't seem to leave the house at all come the winter. Whereas I, I, I'm outside working all winter. I like getting stuff done in the winter because then mm. when spring, summer comes around, you don't have to do all your chores around the yard or whatever it is. You know, when you own a house, it's a lot different to renting because you actually have to fix stuff. You know, and this house that we're in, it's 200 year old and made of dry stone. So you're constantly fixing things all the time. There's always a leak or a drip or a pipe or an electricity thing going on. You know, it's an absolute, like this, this whole building, our studio didn't even have water when I started. We really? plumbed it. Yeah, it had two light bulbs in the main hall and that was it. Um, so for us, they fit an entire studio in it. It was basically like starting from scratch. Mm. You know, it was it was a ton of work. Um, but studios are, I love studios, I have to admit. That, that's why I lived in London too. Where did you live when you were in London? I lived in Wood Green for first year. And then I lived Where's Wood Green? In, in north, end of the Piccadilly line. So just right. before you get to, I think it's two stops before you get to Cockfosters. Sorry, what? I know, yeah. I, 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 that's my description because I just love saying that word. <laughs> it's two stops before you get to Cockfosters. Cockfosters, hey, I'll have two pints of Cockfosters. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, London, London still. You... I think London is my favorite city in the world. I, I would say live? that. I lived in South uh, Wimbledon. I lived in. I see. You were fancy. You were fancy. No, trust me, it wasn't. I lived in. I lived in Collier's Wood, the unfancy part of Wimbledon. Um, uh. And uh, I used to work in the stu- Metropolis Studios. Um, I was basically a tea boy. The same thing for me, man. I went to London for two weeks. They w- record with producer Andy Wright. Andy, love you. One of my good friends. Andy's always been there for me. Um, and Andy brought me over to record and write. And I ended up, he gave me a tab at the bar in Metropolis. He gave me a tab at the restaurant. Um, and I remember it was like five or six months later and he just kind of, Looked at me, he's like, How are you still here? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, Well, you give an Irish guy at 18 a tab at a bar and a tab at a restaurant. And I, dude, at that time, too, like I was 18. So, I mean, at that time, you, you remember all the pop scene of like the Sugar Babes and Dido, uh, Richard Ashcroft, The Verve. Wow. Like they were in the studio every single day. And I was 18 years old, just sitting there being like, My mind was just exploding. Um, mm. What do you call her? Um, I don't go back to black. What's her name? Uh, Amy Winehouse. Amy Winehouse was always in that studio. Um, Pete Doherty was there. The time that Kate Moss was caught doing the cocaine in the studio, that was Studio One downstairs, and we were all upstairs in Studio Two, and I remember coming out of the studio, and it was just paparazzi everywhere. Baby Shambles, she was dating Pete Doherty. Dude, those guys were rough. They were like, they were like death warmed up walking around that studio. Really? They really were. Yeah, they were... Some of they were the roughest looking musicians I've ever seen ever, ever by like a country mile. And I know for a fact I'm not the cleanest looking days, but those guys took the trumpet. <laughs> Dude, you should have seen them. They were like something you seen walking around, like completely out of their minds, like big wow. yellow sacks and lighters in their hands, lighters all the time. And I don't it's even know how an, they were recording music. Isn't it such an interesting thing? Like I. Like, I wouldn't be able to do this. And we've talked about vocal health and we've talked about health on the road and just being able to actually get up there every night and do the show. And, like, I I think, you know, like, there's, there's like, Dave, Dave Matthews. Love him or hate him. But Dave Matthews gets up on stage every night and sings his ass off. Yep. Sings his ass off every night. Yep. And whether you like his voice or you don't, he get, like I've been to Dave Matthews Band shows, and and the thing that I've always remarked is, how do you do this every night? Like it's like boom, and there's there's so many acts that do that. Like Ricky Skaggs, another guy who, whether you're into bluegrass or not, Ricky Skaggs gets up there and sings, like there's no tomorrow. You yeah. do that. I remember uh, you were you played in the City Winery here in Nashville uh, a couple of years ago. I remember going along to the show. I remember sitting there being like. This guy sings his ass off. But you, there is a limitation to that that I, I guess isn't 
other singers and musicians know that, or maybe more so singers, because it's again like I can play the same stuff on guitar pretty much every night. Yeah, I can probably do like I mean I remember back when I used to do guitar gigs and do like four and five hour gigs of playing trad on the guitar for five yeah. hours, and your <laughs> hand to be broken, but you do it again the next day and be grand. Whereas yeah, singing for two and a half hours a night. Oh, singing for two and a half hours a day, which is generally what you do on tour between soundcheck and your gig. What, about two and a half? There, thereabouts? Yeah. On yeah. average? You have to, like, I might, like, yeah, yeah. You're not out drinking, roaring at the bar afterwards, definitely, if you're doing six or seven shows a week. Uh, I don't know how yeah. they did it. Like, how did, how did Pete Doherty sing? Well, he doesn't. I guess, yeah. Uh, sunny man, even sunny we have a happy can is somebody don't you know? That's not that's not them, but that's how he sounds, you know. I, I actually baby shambles. I thought they were great. I really yeah. did. I liked them. But um, but I when it comes to singing, man, I don't know. I remember when I first joined Celtic Thunder. I used to sing all the time in bars, and I would sing at trad sessions, and you know you could sing louder than the whole bar. Um. And then I joined Celtic Thunder, and everybody kind of feared me, and they feel in a certain way. It was really weird, and I normally don't listen to people just because I'm stupid. And I was just like, everybody was like, you need to drink water. You need to do vocal warm-ups. And I was like, what the fuck? Vocal war- what? what? Why do you warm up? Why, how do you, why do you warm your voice? Why would you? What's a vocal warm-up? I was like, I can just do this and just let it rip. And like, I, ne- I still don't do vocal warm-ups. If I'm, if I'm doing vocal warm-ups, there's something seriously wrong. Like, yeah. I, I am struggling. For me to do a vocal warm. When I first joined Celtic Thunder, everybody was constantly like sipping water and had bottles of water at all the different exits in the stage. And I was like, fuck, my head's fried. Do I have to do this? So I started doing it. And thinking about it now, I didn't even have to sing that hard at all. I mean, you're just doing like four solo songs and then doing harmonies. So, you know, you're doing harmonies so you can kind of float in between people if your voice isn't mm-hmm. tip top. But I think what done it to me on those tours is we had in ears all the time, and you, if you're doing five piece harmonies, which weren't easy, you would have had yourself turned up. So you're very conscious of what you were hearing of yourself all the time. So if it wasn't perfect yeah. in my mind, that's kind of what screwed me. But then, after years and years of doing it, I was just like, this is all in your mind. It's all in your head. And the mm-hmm. second I started telling myself that, you know, it it really was easier after that. I yeah. find singing, but also it's like practice. It's like writing songs. You know, you look back and see mistakes. There's certain ways now. I, I feel like there's two or three different parts to my voice, yeah. or to my throat. And if I want to hit a certain note, there's like a few different ways that you can skin a cat. You know, it mightn't sound the mm-hmm. same tone or the same uh, yeah. timbre every night, but I'll still hit that note with a different part of my voice. You know, and I think again, that's just with years of doing it. You know, that's mm-hmm. doing 120 shows a year at full yeah. tilt. And then, and you're right because what you probably learned naturally, <clears throat> what you probably learned naturally, was what part of your voice, like the kind of like you stack up your vocal cords in whichever way you're gonna sing, and you probably just learned naturally what the most economic way to do that is, you know? Yeah, they actually Celtic Thunder. They got all these. They got a vocal coach in one time. I can't remember her name. Maureen something. Do you know her? Irish, very famous vocal coach. Maureen. Maybe I just made that name up. But everybody had to go on, you know, and everybody was on with her for like an hour or whatever. And she was going to start doing this with people, you know, to keep the strength in people's voices and get everybody ready. And I went on and I sang like a song. And she just was like, yeah, I can't really do anything for you. But it wasn't even, <laughs> she just, she basically told me to beat it. I was like, I, I was like, am I? Should I be insulted by this or what's going on? But she was basically like, you're going to do whatever you go, you're going to do you. So you could, you should yeah. just go and do you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I singing man, I genuinely believe it's all in your mind. You know, I really True, I yeah. do think it's. You just Depends have to go on how you're singing like as well. Because I remember going to, a, I kind of damaged my voice a couple of years ago. It's grand now again, but it was a mixture of singing through tonsillitis. Probably drinking too much, not really sleeping or recovering or whatever in between gigs. And just it was one tour where I really, I uh, like, it was bad. Like I 
wrecked my voice. Like silent for four days kind of wrecked my voice. Yeah. It took me That's years the hard part when you're on tour. It's recovery. You know, it's if, mm-hmm. if you've wrecked it and you have to do it the next day and you have to do it the next day, it's just it's going to take longer and longer to fix. Yeah. Um, but I kind of got anxious about it. And I, what I think I realized was it was like my fault was actually trying to be too controlling. Like I... Because like, we have we use in ears on stage as well, and yeah, you know you have your voice loud, and I'm the singer, I'm the guitar player, I'm the bass player, and I provide a lot of the rhythm for the band. So it's kind of like quite a lot going on at the one time. Mm. And I think what I was doing, because I've been working on it a lot in the last couple of years, was I was actually just controlling my voice too much. I was trying to be. It's like, you know, I was being, I was really tense when I sang. Yeah. I was so nervous to be out of tune or out of time or to not pronounce the word correctly, you know? Um, and then when I realized, it's like my favorite singer is like, if you record a, a show of your favorite singer and listen back to every note, going to be a few ones in, that are probably a little bit. For sure. Pitch, they're going to be pitchy. They're going to be a little bit slow. But that's what makes fast. it real. That is way preferential than singing in a show and you're so stressed out that you're wrecking your voice. It's not natural. It's not fun. You know, singing is fun. You're telling a story. It's great. People are listening to you. Listen to your voice. And and I think once I started, can I remember having a conversation with you in Nashville in, man, was was it, was it your show? Was it a show? Was it around Christmas, I think. Because I remember well, going to a bar yeah. for a drink yeah. afterwards and there being sleighs and mad shit all around us. and Yeah, that's uh, right. And I remember having a chat with you because it was something that was really stressing me out at the time. And I remember your advice was that the, the more I forgot about it, the better it will get. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, that, that is what happened. Like, I, the, the more I let go and just accepted that my voice was going to sound like whatever it was going to sound like that day. Like, it's probably like, going to sound better. Yeah, because it's just like, my voice is my voice. I can try and, and it's, control it's, it. It's funny when you say that. You know, when you think about your first take, you know, your demo vocal or your first take in the studio was normally always your best because you're not thinking about it. Way better. You're, not, yeah. you're never thinking that this is going to be the one. You're just like, oh, this is whatever. I'm just going to fucking just do my thing here. And normally, mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, everybody's like, that's the take. You have to try and make it better. And you, you never can. You, you can't yeah. make it better than first. Beat. You can spend weeks. Sometimes it's hard to beat the scratch vocals, you know? Scratch vocals, man. And I have work on. As well, I Go ahead. Say. My record that I'm working on right now, I never really think about doing vocals because I'm lucky I can keep singing and singing and singing. My voice doesn't tire. Whenever we were doing my record here with Brett and Austin in October, um, I've got like 30 takes of vocals on every song. And I just have to actually go through them right now and edit mm. them. It's kind of putting me off doing it. I just hate yeah. doing it. I'd rather just go and do one take and be like, eh, I'll do it. Well, it's probably better to do. What I've found lately is like, I mean, just kind of producing some music here just for fun, seeing what seeing what comes out. And what I found is like, record the vocals, go and listen to it. And then a day or two later, go in. It's like a set it and forget it kind of idea where you kind of like listen to it. Like, what should that be? What should that, particularly when you're recording music that you've, you've, you've written, but haven't actually performed out that much, which tends to be a lot of what we do as a band, is like we keep, we probably don't play a lot of the songs live a huge amount before they go on a record. Do you do that through choice or? I don't know. I don't know. Here, here's the thing. Like, what songs do you play every night? That's like, that's, a, that's one of, I write the set lists for the band and it's like one of the most stressful parts of my day. Where I'm going like, all right, I got a message earlier that said someone wanted to hear Light in the Sky. Someone also wanted to hear this song and this song and this song. But then these are like four songs that have weird things in them that are kind of unique. And I want to do them tonight. But then there's, oh man, this song really features the banjo. uh, And there's nothing else really in the set that features the two banjos. So I have to kind of put this song in. And I, man, I get in my head about it. And sometimes I just kind of go out and just don't write a set list because of that idea of like, what songs are we going to do? And so by the time we get down to it, the space for throwing in new songs. And it's, I'm, I'm saying all this with, with the edge of this. This is an amazing problem to have. Is that there's, yeah. 
there's there's always someone who says I missed a song. <laughs> You can, you can always... never, you can never keep everybody happy, man. Like no, you, no. Every night that you do a show, ever without a, without a shadow, without somebody will come up to be like that show was awesome. But and you just feel it like going. Yeah. But you need to get in your car and leave me alone <laughs> right now, man. Well, and it, and it's it's unfortunate, but then again, it's like well, you know, you hear come it. back next time. Yeah, and. <laughs> And so by the time it comes down to it, finding a spot for new stuff in the set can be tough, particularly for the way yeah. our, like we're a quite a high energy show as well. Like, you know, uh, um, when it's more like acoustic stuff and it, w- it was just myself up there, it'd be a different thing. It's kind of like you're telling a story, but a lot of the time our shows tend to be kind of a mad, crazy dance party by the end where there's people standing on chairs and things are, you know, it's it kind of, and at that point it's kind of hard to put in stuff that, it's hard to put in the music that's new and fresh because you're road testing it. It's a bit shakier. It's not as arranged. It's not as sm- smooth or clean. And oh yeah, we've been we've been testing new songs on the road. And do you guys do you guys rehearse much before you hit the road? I'd say we've had four rehearsals in the entire lifetime of the band. <laughs> Same thing. My my piano player Peter laughs at me, man. I'm like. The last time we went on tour, and we aren't even like a band, we just like two players and Peter, yeah. like what keys are on? And I'm like, I don't, I'm like, ah, uh, because I don't know any of the chords. And I'm like, I keep it up in some way. I'm like, strum it. I'm like, that's the key. And Peter, be like, ah, yeah, sure, grand. <laughs> <laughs> and the two of us be pissing ourselves, laughing at the turns and the songs. And but I, the reason why I don't like rehearsing is because I feel like rehearsals takes away from your actual performance. I'm a performer. I don't go out there and regurgitate the same thing every night. Yeah, I go out there. And take an idea and paint it as big and beautiful as I can every night that I go on stage. And I feel like if you know exactly how to paint it every night, you're just going to get blasé and go, this yeah. is how it's done. And thank you. There you are very much. It's two, it's two different sides of music as well. I mean, I think that there's a composing side of music and there's an arrangement side of music. And with different things, like sometimes we do need to arrange things. Like we won't have a rehearsal, but we'll like talk, have a chat about it because yeah. Essentially what banjo has is it I play the guitar at the bass and I sing. And then there's a mandolin player and a banjo player, another banjo player and a fiddle player. So there's three other guys on stage who are all playing lead instruments. So it's kind of like having three lead guitar players in a band. But that's amazing because no it's matter a- what, if you make a mistake, you're like banjo solo, fiddle solo, mando solo. And everybody's <laughs> like, and you're just like, oh, we got away with that one again. Yes, yeah, yeah. take it off the old box. Yeah, and when your voice is shaky, you just like you double down on the solo. You sing three, ver- <laughs> sing two, two thirds of the of the, the verses that are in the song. Yeah, but it's it's just an interesting thing. I think I think the arrangement side of music is something that I really enjoy as well. Like taking a song, um, and it's what man, it's what I love about like it's what I, I've been listening to a lot of music uh, lately. That's more kind of versed in the kind of i suppose it's not electronic but it's like kind of down that i don't know if you've listened much to asgare or noah gunderson a couple of artists ah yeah yeah that are like and it's like the in 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 music i do think when you're producing a record the arrangement is so important because you can throw the kitchen sink at a song you can turf the whole thing at a song there's something really beautiful about intentionality, like the um, using the required amount of something. It's like cooking a dish. If you cook a curry, yeah. man, you can take, you can cook a curry, chop up your, chop up all your ingredients, throw them into a pot, and douse it in curry powder and pray and hope for the best. Yeah. But there's something really good. Cool, there's something really special about knowing. Oh, this is how much of this I want, and this is yeah, this is what I wanted this, and what that eventually boils down to. And I think making a record is the same way, and it's kind of the I suppose it's the more. It is fun. It's not as fun as just getting up there and hacking into it. Like what that's that's what we were that's what we love doing. You know, I love just playing. I love doing that too. Like I I and I realize a lot of my fans love me singing slow stuff, but I think mm. I just done so many years of Celtic Thunder and slow stuff. Mm. When I go on stage, I just want to smash shit. Like, that's just how yeah. I feel. I get so excited. And I'm just like, ah, fuck, let's go faster. Yeah. yeah. I just absolutely lose my mind. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Well, that's but I feel the... like people people want that too, especially in America. I mean, we're 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 blue ones in America. But Americans like the party. They want a party. Oh man, absolutely. I think everyone likes the party. I think that there's, I'm, uh, for, my fellow Irish listeners will forgive me for saying this, but I think that there's a, I think it's lifting. I think that there was a self consciousness in Ireland around dancing at gigs. I felt that for sure. I went to gigs, I was like, no, like I want people at my gigs to dance. But I feel awkward to dance at other people's gigs myself. Like, you know. Uh, yeah. But I think that that's lifting, and I'm seeing it. Like, and I'm, you know, we we play, played a couple of shows in in Ireland over the last couple of years, where you see a progression, and you're like, wow, people are mental. People are ready to go. Um, we did a gig in Galway. Our last gig in Galway was in um, Leisureland, down in uh, down on the Salt Hill Prom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, well. We, we actually had a couple of our American fans who flew over for the gig. Amazing. It was great. But they sat down, for, they came down front. It's like, a, you know, think of 1,100 people stuffed in a, in a hall in Galway. And it's, my parents were there. Very quiet, right? Very. My, my dad's one of the quietest guys you've ever met in your life. He's, I think he's like, a, he's a hidden poet. Because the stuff he says, he says about, I'd say 85 words a year. But every, <laughs> every word is pure gold. One day he turns and he goes, uh, this is a side, but uh, one time, you know, we were chatting about something, and I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was music or something. And my mother was like, "Oh, I don't really care for that guy's music." My dad turned and went, "I suppose burnt toast is nice if you like it." <laughs> this is the kind of guy he is. He's just really like pensive and what's joyful. That, but... What's that? What's that saying? You're better off to stay quiet and be thoughtful than to speak out loud and be known as one. Yeah, yeah. But so you can imagine these are the people in the room and it's like old school teachers, reserve school teachers and myself and, you know, a lot of reserve people, like a couple of young people and, you know, a mixed crowd. But, you know, I never think of Ireland as a dancing crowd. So we start the gig and all the, the people who had sat up the front were, there was a couple of American people, a couple of Irish people. There was a couple of Jap- Japanese people who had flown over. It was mental. It was crazy. Hometown gig and like half the world there. Amazing. But what I noticed was the Americans... Like, as we came out on stage, the Americans stood up and they were like, lads, I don't give a shit if there's 900 people directly behind me. I'm dancing. <laughs> and the Japanese people stood up and the couple of Irish people stood up. And then about a quarter of the way into the gig, the lights kind of come up a little bit and I spot my dad. Same guy who says <laughs> like 85 words a year, very quiet, very reserved, really sensitive, like one of the most beautiful people I've ever known in my life. An amazing guy. Would never, I would never see him dancing. My dad is in the aisle dancing with my mother. And they're like, amazing. like on fucking Dancing with the Stars. And I realized <laughs> what it was. Catalyst. That's what, of course. that's what sometimes we, that is missing at a gig. It's a catalyst. It's, it was the couple of people up the front. It was the Irish people who love dancing, but maybe wouldn't, wouldn't be the first to get up. They love dancing. And once they're up, they're going to go for it. And then them mixed with the Americans who were there used to our gigs in America were like, we walk out of stage, everyone stands up and we just dance for 90 minutes. And the Americans were the catalysts for the Irish that were catalysts for the Japanese. And then the whole crowd starts dancing. And I think that that, that was like, that's special because that taught me that it's like, everybody wants to have a good time. That's, of course. What, they, that's what they pay the ticket for. They just want to have a good time. And yeah. it's just... Most people, I think, give, given the option, it'd be an interesting thing to poll. Like, if you take someone who hates dancing, I don't like dancing, and say, if I gave you the opportunity to dance at a show, but nobody else is going to see you, for you sure, just move whatever I want, and not a single other person is going to see you. I'd be fairly confident that most people, if they looked inward, they don't, they don't dislike dancing. They're just self-conscious about dancing. Yeah, I think Irish people are pretty self-conscious though. I mean, I don't for sure. I, f- I feel that Irish people are way more self-conscious than American people. I think it's changing though. Like, I and I have to it say, probably, like, it probably is changing. Yeah, but I'm I mean, growing up changing. to at gigs, I I don't remember unless everybody was smashed drunk. I don't remember people like standing up and dancing straight away. You know, yeah. maybe at the very end of the night they might be doing that. I mean, I don't, I don't, we don't a gig. Last St. Patrick's Day was the first St. Patrick's Day that I stayed in Ireland in over ten years. Wow. Um, not St. Patrick's Day this year, the year before. And me and my old band, we decided to do three gigs. We'd done a West Coast tour of Ireland. We'd done Galway. We played Monroe's. 
we played Sligo and we played uh, just down the road here in Bonkrana at uh, Mickey's Joint. Uh, the Drift Inn, shout out to the Drift Inn if you hear this. Um, and we played there on St. Paddy's Day. And, you know, all the gigs were at, like, friends, bars, and we weren't doing it for money, man. There was five of us in a van doing a, a three-gig tour. Um, so everywhere we went, it was, like, party time. So it was party time in Galway with the Monroes. And then we get into the van, drove to Sligo and Strand Hill, shout out everybody um, in Strand Hill. And we were there. I've, I've been going to Strand Hill surfing since I was a kid, so it was, like, a hometown gig for me and everybody there. It was partying all night. And then it was a daytime gig that Sunday in the local bar. So we had to get up at like nine in the morning. Everybody was absolutely busted getting under the van, going to do a gig on St. Paddy's Day, loaded the gear on. And we're, do you know, just like when you're just, you just don't care. It was like my old band and we weren't doing it. They look cool. We weren't doing it to um, get Instagram likes. We weren't doing it for people to like, we were just playing because we love playing together and mm. we just let, absolutely let rip. But I found Irish people were all like, you could tell they were like, fuck, I really want to take my shirt off and dance right now, but I can't. I'm just going to stand here because that's what everybody does here and that's just the way it's going to be. And then come the end of the gig, they were letting loose then, you know, because they lost their inhibitions a bit. Must have been something they ate. But, uh, yeah, I, I feel like, I feel like... It's all the malt and barley, man. <laughs> I know, hey. I feel like, I don't know. But, yeah, you're probably right. You, you pro- I mean, you are right. I think People here probably... You have to understand, I suppose, as well, we're like Irish and man we're hitting all the demographics of conversation points we're, like Ireland's a recovering nation like I mean like it's people like think For of our sure. parents our parents generation like we're more reserved like our grandparents lived through rations and mad stuff like that and like we're a recovering people like we're we're all like our parents generation were probably the first generation of people that truly actually ruled themselves and had some sort of say before it's funny, that. Yeah. It's funny that you say that because I always say that about meat in Ireland. Like growing up, everybody had to have meat in their dinner. And if I felt if we didn't eat meat in our dinner, which was really weird, but this is how I, whatever way in my mind, I used to remember thinking, are we poor? Are we, why are we eating fish or something like that? We should be eating like steak. We should be eating. And I feel that in Ireland, that's why so many people eat meat. It's because back in the day of the famine, nobody had meat and only yeah. rich people ate meat. So then when everybody could afford it, they were like, well, we have to eat this every single day. Yeah. Um, my, yeah. My grandmother hated fish. She didn't like fish because. It's not so head, funny because it's like a pauper's food. Yeah. Yeah. Fish is poverty. And like, you know, when I think of making myself a nice dinner, it's like I'm making tuna steaks or I'm like grilling really nice pieces of salmon. It's like that was poverty food to them. You well, know, in London, in, in the Thames, back in the day, all the poor people used to go to the Thames and the tide was out and eat oysters. Oysters were poverty food. You think of lobsters. Lobsters were served up to people in prisons. Lobster was prison food. That's what they used, used to get people. crazy how the world changes, you know? Yeah, I mean, and like right now, too, if you look at in, in America, there's so much of a problem um, with the overpopulation of wild boars. So they've actually passed a law in Texas and maybe, a few, of course, Texas, but maybe a few other states where you can actually, there's so many boars now killing crops um, and they aren't native to, to a lot of these places that you're, you're allowed to shoot the boars from a helicopter with a machine gun. <laughs> I'm not laughing because of killing of animals. I'm laughing because it's fucking crazy. Mm-hmm, amazing. So you can literally imagine like a guy like dressed as Rambo, emptying into a field full of pigs, basically. And it's legal. And now they're giving this wild boar, because there's so much of it, they're giving it to prisons. And they're giving it to people who are working in, like, uh, homeless shelters. And people are bitching about it, saying it doesn't taste good. Wild, organic boar. And people are saying, "Mm, I don't like it. The world is a messed up place when it comes to food. (laughs) Are you veggie? No. Yeah, yeah. I've I've been veggie for the past... um, Five years nearly now, and then in the last, but I'm like the worst vegetarian. I've always missed eating meat. You know, I grew up, my dad was a butcher. Um, my family all worked in the slaughterhouse. We hunted, we fished, um, and I, I've always missed eating meat. But the reason why I stopped eating meat was because of being on tour, and you can't keep eating that shit Subway or McDonald's every day and when there's no choice. So I made a conscious decision to stop, and I'm buying the Sprinter van and building the kitchen so that I could make my own food. But in the past six months, I've started eating bits and pieces of meat again. Um, like I had about a wild, wild venison this week. Um, hmm. but I'm only eating stuff that, that is wild and is plentiful and doesn't come from, you know, 
a shitty source. You can you can sense the difference as well of like, you know, we grew up. I, me, me and Martin. Uh, for people who don't know, I have a brother who's also in the band, myself and Martin, and we grew up on a farm in kind of South Galway. And like we had grown up, we had like lamb. That was like we our we our dad farmed beef, and so we trade some of our beef with another farmer across the road and we get some lamb and so we'd have a freezer half freezer beef and half a freezer fresh lamb and that was about i mean we had all of our own stuff and, and meat and we you know we had chicken as well from time to time and whatever but it was always local and organic it was only when it was only kind of like i suppose moving to america that i noticed the big big shift for me was like i just physically couldn't eat as much meat as what yeah. i was do you know um it's definitely nowhere near as good in the states well it's just i think it's 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 a tough it's an economic kind of quandary is like oh, for sure i mean i understand why it's not 15 million it's people of, for sure yeah. um but i but it, I remember one time being on tour and driving up for, on the road from l80 san francisco and if you take the one there's the one which is the pretty road and the other road just the straight shot up to san fran and I remember passing. I'd never seen one of the cattle farms before. I'd, d- I'd just never seen it. And it literally blew my mind. That was about seven years ago. And I'd never experienced I was I was like shocked. I looked mm. at all these cows in these fields with, without a blade of grass. And they're just all chowing down on these bags of processed food, like eating, eating, eating. And they're just fattening them up. And I was like, well, it completely, that, that really made me, I don't know why I just didn't think about how meat was produced in the States. Um, of and up yeah. until then, I was just eating beef and eating whatever, you know. And then I was like, "Whoa, is this?" So it's not like how we have it in Ireland. Like we are, we are spoiled here. For I don't think people oh hear me. Oh my god, it is. Man, I every time I come home, my dearest mother, she's amazing. She every time myself and Martin come home, she'll go out and she'll get lamb some from somewhere. She'll <laughs> maybe she'll tap up one of the the local lads that has a lamb farm or something or a sheep farm and she'll get it some lamb and because it's like she knows that like that's the one that's the big thing that i because i probably i eat a good bit of meat probably still but not every day not and it's not i try not to centralize my food our options around meat like actually on our tech rider i hope no none of the venue organizers that have ever been put to, to any stress about this uh hear this but like on our tech rider i am down myself and fergal are both down as vegetarians yeah because it's I just it, it's an easier an easier kind of I find as well like just it was diversifying food and and changing changing it up that kind of helped my health a lot in the last kind of couple of years because you do if you're if you're you're on tour and it's like ah you know there's a Denny's there they like, just eat there or like spend the next twenty minutes trying to figure out somewhere that's better no, and no. honestly spending another hour figuring out somewhere that's better is worth it. When you're on yeah. tour, you're ordering three meals a day. This has been amazing in the last couple of weeks. Like I think that myself and again, two touring musicians living in the same house here. We we've I don't think this is I don't think we've been home at the same time for more than two weeks at any point. Ever. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we have we basically we've said like we're like you know and normally even when I'm home I normally eat out probably five six times a week just because I'm lazy and I'm used to doing that. But like it's been amazing to be a cook. I've cooked all my own meals in the last month or whatever, and it's just it's such an, a different way of living. And I think there's there's like there's a there's a lot of it's a it's a gift. It's a gift to be able to go to somewhere and and have someone cook you food. It's amazing. Um, yeah, funny. I keep saying that too. But all I do, all I felt like we. I mean, we haven't left the house now in four and a half weeks, and. All I feel that we're doing is just cleaning dishes. Just feels like all we seem to do. The kitchen just seems to be perpetually dirty, no matter how hard I fucking clean it. And especially having our kid now too, because he's just like, he just throws shit everywhere and you just have to let him at it. You know, you put everything on there and he just looks at me on the table and he's like, ha! <laughs> and you just look at him and you're like, all right, that's cool. Just do whatever you want. He's been teething, yeah. man, so hard the past like three, four days. He's been an really? absolute nightmare. Yeah. Yesterday, Kelsey and I must have tried for about four hours 
between ourselves to get him to sleep, to get him in the naps, and he must only a nap 20 minutes. It took us four hours, and we got like 20 minutes of napping time. And then he woke at three o'clock. We haven't had a full night's sleep since he was born. I mean, like, I mean, like, when I mean a full night's sleep, I don't mind getting up and be like, yo, you're cool. Like, last night I got up at three and I was just sitting, shaking him with my hand until like four, quarter past four in the morning, and your eyes just pitch black, staring at <laughs> the distance. But it's weird, man. It's the strangest thing having a kid. There's no love like it. You mean yeah. you really would, you really would throw yourself in front of 10 moving buses, you know? And somehow you would find the, the the will to get back up and help them out. You know, it's the strangest, weirdest thing. I wouldn't do it and, for anybody. I wouldn't do it for well, myself. I think that you, funny enough, you have a great personality to be a dad. Like, I think... Me? The, yeah, I think, I, I honestly, I think that, like, what men need now is, is, is I don't know. I think that as, as guys... Feel like it's really important the step forward for fellas is be invested be open be confident in and and be uh, emotionally available be fearless about what you're feeling and what you're you're thinking you know and as performers it's in some ways where you i'm used to going out on stage and talking about my mental health to yeah. thousands of people a night every night and yeah and i keep reminding myself is Someday, if I become a dad, I have to be able to be that same level of emotional openness with that. You'll be you'll be a good dad, brother. You just need a, you just need the quarantine to get over and find this is right. <laughs> I bet you there's going to be lots of babies born at the end of this quarantine. Oh yeah, <laughs> quarantine babies. Nine months from so, now, there's so much Netflix now, and chilling happening right now. It's just out of fucking control. There's just going to be babies. Yeah. Eight months from now, where are we at? We're in April, May. Like, come like March next year. There's going to be so many St. Patty's babies next year. Yeah. They're just going to yeah. be everywhere. Maybe there'll be a whole, uh, maybe there'll be a whole like swathe of children called Paddy again. Like, Paddy, the name Paddy will go through the fucking roof in America. <laughs> Dude, shit. Yeah. Paddy's Day in America. I couldn't believe. I still can't believe. I mean, I love it, but I just can't believe how much the Americans party on Paddy. It's Paddy's month, I call it. It's a month, maybe yeah. longer. Yeah. Then other yeah. places celebrate it in the middle of summer because it's too cold. So they have Paddy's month in the middle of August. Amazing. Like, I feel, I feel honored in a lot of respects. Like, for sure. Love, love it month. or hate it. Like, there's people out there celebrating your culture. It's amazing. Isn't it like, so strange when you think of how small Ireland is? No matter where you go in the world, there's always an Irish pub, or and yeah. they celebrate Paddy's Day like nothing normal. Yeah, and we wouldn't know, but but like, there's a brr, like I wouldn't know. I don't know. Maybe they do, but like, do American people meet other American people and be like, "Oh, you're American. We I feel some connection to you," and maybe that's just a thing of being in a foreign country. But like, even like you know, if I meet another Irish person out here. Like, I feel like we have a commonality about ourselves. You know, we have something for sure, a deep connection. Sure, but even I, if it's I actually, like we're from three hundred miles away. <laughs> I actually other. do the opposite though. Whenever I, whenever I went to London when I was eighteen, I found that I used to live near. It was Clapham where I used to live near, and all the Irish and yeah. Australians hung out there together, and it was fun. You know, it was whatever hanging out with them all. Um, but whenever. Whenever I went to America, I chose not to hang out with Irish people. I didn't go to America purposely to hang out with Irish people. And I don't mean that in a bad way. You know, yeah. it's like I didn't I don't go to Bali to go to an Irish bar. I go to Bali to hang out with Balinese people and see what the yeah. people are like and hang out with the locals. And so most of the time when I hear Irish people, because I feel like and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think Irish people like they colonate with each other when they go to a place. They're like they like, oh, you're Irish. Well, then we have to hang out. And I'm just weird. I like to do the opposite of what everybody wants. So I just probably yeah. run away from no, it. There's, I think that's a good thing as well. I mean, you're right. That's what we did come here to do was to kind of push the horizons and stuff. And so as I enjoy, I enjoy a mix of both. But like, I don't, there's a, like, I probably have two or three friends here that are, are from Ireland. But I, like, I uh, wouldn't see them a whole ton. I suppose at the moment, I'm not seeing anybody. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a weird time, man. Right now, all we have is social media, podcasts, music, and net movies and Netflix. And speaking of social media, my Facebook page has been hacked. I know. I saw that yesterday. It's, it's an absolute nightmare. 
there's like these bunch of Indian dudes who are now running my my um my page, and I don't know how to get them off. I have a bunch of I literally have I literally was like a madman last night. It's very worrying because you know yourself nowadays the only way for musicians to get their stuff out there is social media. Nobody yeah. can pay for PR anymore, especially right now when all this is happening. Our only connection mm. to our fans and the rest of the world is your social media platform. And I mean, my Facebook page, it hasn't got a bunch of followers. It's got nearly 80,000 followers. and But it's taken me 14, 15 years to build that stupid page and create those followers. And you realize how important it is for you whenever someone takes it away. Right now, I can't. Like, I don't know, an amazing podcast last night with Ashley Campbell. She was in Nash, She's in Nashville as well. You know, and I forgot that I couldn't post it on my Facebook page. And I went on my Facebook page today and I couldn't put it on there. And I was like, this is fucked. So I have like, I literally text everybody that I knew this morning who might know someone who might know someone mm. in, in the Facebook world. And what's really strange is not a lot of people know anybody. Do you know anybody? I Come to think of it, I have never even heard of anybody that works for Facebook. Yeah, I literally do not know a single person who works for Facebook. And I checked with our we banjo three crew as well and none of them that's like two and a half thousand people who are just in this kind of inner circle we banjo three it's not so of. strange they must i i really don't know i actually have gotten through to like two people a buddy of mine in nashville he's actually helped me out right now and by chance a cousin in ireland her cousin works in san francisco and she is looking into it but by the looks of it what's happened to me is they've completely kicked me off my page I can't edit anything on my, but I can still log in. So I don't really understand. I don't know if it's a bot that's done it or if it's spam or if, I don't understand. So I can still log into the page and look at it. I'm an analyst on my own page. Um, and someone else has made themselves an editor. So I can't post anything on there. I can't delete anything on there. I can't read any messages. I can't do anything on the page. Um, and it's just, it's kind of worrying. It's sad. I, I'm kind of disgusted at the fact it's worrying me because it shouldn't, but it sadly is because it's the only connection that I have. Well, it's very right worrying now. as well because it's also your personal brand in a lot of respects. So, you know, someone could say something on exactly. that and put your name at the end of it. And, like, people trust you. For sure. Artist, you know? Like, right now they're posting all these weird videos of kids who are being adopted and they've posted something. I don't even know. All these weird videos. And I've, I, I mean... Obviously, some people might have seen your post saying that, you know, your page has been hacked, but the majority of people won't have seen your post and then they see these weird videos and you're like, either unfollow you or report you or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I'm just waiting right now to hear word back from a bunch of people. I literally contacted every single I wonder, person. I wonder, does, would it help if people did report it? Like, how does that work? I'm thinking that as well. But then again, I'm afraid if lots of people are reporting it in the foreground and they see that, do they delete the page? Yeah, and then you get I don't really know but it brings up a really interesting conversation of like what it is to be a musician nowadays and to be an entertainer and to be a person like an, if you, it doesn't matter if you're an actor or a musician composer doesn't matter what you are but like there's an extra thing like to have a an online presence it's so important yeah. like I, mean, I enjoy Instagram doing it but Facebook it is it's and, a it's a it's a full time job yeah I mean, that's what my job in the band is. You know, I write songs, I play guitar and sing, and I also manage our social media, which is a... Yeah, I mean, there's companies out thing. there that do it. I mean, it is an actual career. Social media is an actual career. Um, mm. There's people that lot, lot make lots of money off it, but bands can't afford those people unless you're Miley Cyrus or someone like that. Um, mm -hmm. If Miley Cyrus but, is listening, can you help us? Miley, help us. Miley, go on, lend me a fiver, will you? <laughs> I actually, I actually recorded um, "Achy Breaky Heart" for the anniversary of the song for Billy Ray. No way. Yes, I met Billy. I wrote a song. Well, I met Billy Ray Cyrus. I done a gig one time in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I mean, talk about a gig! It was. Uh, who played the first night? So it was like uh, Muhammad. It was Muhammad Ali's fight night, and the first night was for like the main VVVAP people. Um, at the at the thing, so there was like this big beautiful marquee on a on a golf course in Phoenix, and they had the very important people there who get like an extra night of music before the main mm -hmm. event. And David Foster curates it. Billy Ray Cyrus was singing at it. I sang at it. Um, Haley Reinhardt sang at it. Um, the first night, I can't remember who else was there. 
And so I met Billy Ray that night and got chatting to him. And he, I mean, he's an awesome dude, man. He really is a down to earth, good old country boy. I was on sound checking and he came in and he was drinking like a rum and coke or something. He was like, that boy can sing. Well, that's my really southern drawl accent, but accent, good. but I, I like it. And he was like, he was like a really, like he's a really genuine dude. I've chatted to him a few times. Uh, and the next night after that, dude, the next night I wasn't supposed to perform. And there was about 4,000 people in a room. And the cheapest plate in the room was like a thousand bucks. And I was only there because I was playing the night before. So you may guess the high end people that were at this thing. And David Foster, who I had just on my record with at the time, David was curating all the music for the show. And he was at the very front. Um, was literally sitting right opposite um, uh, Muhammad Ali, what do you call the actor, Billy Crystal, uh, Rita Wilson, Tom Hanks, like all these name dropping everywhere, but like you name it, like the, the top of the pops, yeah. they were all sitting at the table and I was sitting there and amongst them all, I was like, <laughs> what's happening? Like literally right, like literally looking at Muhammad Ali and Steve Martin, he played, uh, um, Steve Martin went up and played. Rita Wilson went up and played. Um, Billy Ray Cyrus went up and played. Who else went up and played? Billy Ray Cyrus went up and played. Uh, Andre Bocelli went up and sang Mezzan Dormy. <laughs> like, just, like, people crying everywhere, like doves coming up into the sky. They literally had pyrotechnics coming off the front of the stage whenever he hit the big note. Um... And I was sitting there, and I was like, this is fucking awesome. I'm up at the very front table. This is and David Foster grabs the microphone, and he's like, well, after Bocelli, and he's like, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, I, brought you, uh, I brought you Josh Groban. I brought you Michael Bublé. And there's an Irish guy here in the audience tonight, and I want you to meet him. And I'm sitting there in the front, and I genuinely didn't think it was me he was talking about. I was like, who else is Irish? Is there somebody else Irish at the gig? And he's like, could Keith Harkin please come up to the stage after Fucking, what do you call him? Um, Bocelli sang as in Dormy. And I was like, no, I have to follow that. And he was just like, get up. And dude, this wasn't like a get up and do a gig song. This was like a massive production. You know, there was a huge band playing. And he just goes, uh, you're doing By the Time I Get to Phoenix. He told me like a month prior that I might sing it. And I was like, oh, okay. And he just goes to the band, hit it. And it's do do do. And they just started. And I done By the Time I Get to Phoenix. And then after wow. I went on, I finished, and uh, Reba McIntyre was there, side stage. She was like, that was awesome. And then after that, J-Lo walked on. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Lopez walked on after that. That was wow. Nice. How did we get on to that story? Oh, Billy Ray uh, Cyrus. Billy Ray Cyrus, go. Achy but yeah, I wrote a song. Yeah, J-Lo walked on after that. It was a really weird, surreal gig. Um, and it was very, very cool. I met lots of amazing people at that, at that few days. But Billy Ray Cyrus was there. And I remember him telling me that he was writing a book or whatever, and all these people just kept chasing him. And of course, because I was at the bottom of the pigeon feed, um, my room in the hotel was at the very back of the place looking into like the dumps. And I could see Billy Ray just kept like running away from people. And he was like trying to walk away. And I was talking to him for a good while out of my, bal my balcony and people just kept coming after him. So I wrote a song called Run Away Billy Ray. Um, and he ended up liking it and... He, he tweeted me once or twice, and then his management asked. He was doing like a an anniversary of the song, and asked many different people in different genres to do their version of uh, "Achy Breaky Heart." But it was really cool. Like it sent all the original stems of "Achy Breaky Heart," and I got to do my version of "Achy Breaky Heart." So I basically done it. If you could imagine a band that were playing at the Mary of Dunlow contest in Donegal in 1992, and it had like. Galway gear, like squeeze box, like Irish instrumentation, and then all the original stems with his vocal in it and mine. Yeah, man, it was rad. It's on YouTube if anybody gets gets a second. Um, That's class. To hear, but, I want to hear that. Yeah, Billy Rave's a good dude. So if if Miley's listening, please give us a fiver, Miley. They pay for our PR. They pay for our social media. So I'll let you go, Dave. What what else is happening? Anything you want to promote? Any tours that's happening? Do you even know of any tours that's happening? Don't really know of anything that's happening right now. I think the big thing for us is that we're plugging away, we're doing stuff. Uh, we, have a big, we have a big kind of October tour coming up. I mean, that's probably <laughs> the next time we'll be on the road, if we get on the road. Yeah, we have summer gigs, we have all that, all the usual stuff, yeah. We're hopefully going to be getting into studio by the end of the year and recording a new album. Um, and I myself... Where do you think... 
Where do you uh, think you're going to record the record? I don't know. This time I'd, I'd love to record it in Nashville. I'd love to have, I mean, we've, I love Frank's studio as well, our road engineer and sound engineer, uh, Frank Marchand. He has a great studio in Annapolis that we've recorded in a couple of times. And, um, That's where Joey can, records, Joey Harkham. Yeah, yeah, Joey Harkham, yeah. Joey and Frank are yeah. good friends. But I don't know, I, I can't tell. There's also a part of me that, honestly, you've been sending me you've been sending me pictures and I've been hearing about this Barron studio. Man, you never know. Dude, come come on down. Come. I might come to Ireland, come back, come a homecoming album, as they say. Frank Studio might be nice, but has Frank Studio got a full pub, a full Irish bar with an open fire? <laughs> Why did the new Evangel Three record take six and a half months to record? <laughs> wow! Well, have you heard the new Banjo, the Wee Banjo Three record? The new, I can't understand anything anybody says in the whole album. Yeah. Is it, are they speaking in Gaelic? No, they're just absolutely fucking smashed. They were drinking for nine months. Yeah, the, he, the CD comes with a shot of Jameson and a, and a piece of turf. <laughs> well, um, on that note, my friend, I yeah. am going to go in and feed my beautiful child. Um, I really, really appreciate you being on the podcast. Um, oh, we'll have to do this amazing. again sometime soon. Um, I would love, we, I know we were talking earlier in the year, if you're ever going on tour again, I would love to come out and do support with you boys sometime. I think it will be an absolute blast. I yeah. think people will enjoy it too. Um but David, thank you so much for having me, um, hey, or for you, letting Keith. me have you here and having a good chat with me. And I'll send all this stuff on to you, uh, warts and all, whenever I get it all edited. Great, amazing, man. We'll have a we'll, we'll have a pint soon somewhere. I know, I know, sooner than later, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Look all right, yourself. Yeah, the after, bro. Thank you.